Hello everyone and we hope you're all doing very well. So we're looking again at SAMs. Now we've already done a big series explaining the different types of SAMs in DCS. It's in our combined arms playlist and I'll link that at the bottom there and I've got 50 odd videos of explaining the different systems but they are what I would call the simpler SAMs. They're all the one unit SAMs like a SA-13 or an SA-19, a Tunguska or a Strela or something like that. And you can drive them in combined arms, driving them about, use the radars if they've got one, fire the missiles and stuff like that. And as well as that, I explain a little bit of general knowledge about them. But now, as requested by you guys, we want to start looking at the big sites, the static sites. Well, technically they're not static, but you, you know what I mean. Uh, the multi-unit sites, things that we're talking about, SA-6, SA-3, SA-2, SA-11, SA-10. Um, and on the other side, we've got Patriot system, we've got Hawk system, we've got we've just we've done rapier. Rapier is already done. And for these big, multifaceted, multidisciplined systems, it's not enough for me just to show you pretty pictures and read out of the Wikipedia page, which is what I'd basically do normally. We need to start getting real experts in. So we've managed to secure ourselves an expert for this. Yeah, can do you want to quickly tell everyone who you are and your kind of rough qualifications, if you like, to be on this video? Roger, I spent about um, 17, 18 years in the army um 10 of that was as a um patriot crew member through various different roles on the sites before that i was a translator for nsa i got out of the army seven years ago so any mistakes i have on this are just because i haven't been on a pat site for a while but i spent about a quarter of my life working with patriot i was qualified as a master gunner which is kind of a um a system expert, sort of. Yeah, and so I just, I I saw your video where where you had a whole bunch of I don't knows with the mm -hmm. equipment. And I usually see this stuff placed wrong on various missions and whatnot. And there's just not a lot of information out on it. So I thought I'd share it with you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So yeah, we, we literally couldn't get someone, unless we managed to find Mr. Patriot himself or whoever invented the Patriot system. We're not going to get any better than this. And again, I don't want to get kind of what they call keyboard warriors who think they know what everything does and there's lots of them about I want a guy that's actually been there so we couldn't be more lucky and as well as that I mean when it comes to doing the other SAM systems I'm always out there looking for guys like you to interview obviously we have to check that you know we're not sharing any data that we're not allowed to share but beyond that it's all cool uh, should we all look at this first slide everyone so kind of like I guess like a basic overview slide and I apologize it for being a bit um, blurry but it should be readable it was a multi-unit system modular system I guess we'd say it's not just a truck with a missile launcher on it we're going to have a radar set which is going to so that searches it detects it classifies it identifies it tracks it illuminates and it communicates with the missile so this is a very multi is this this is the only radar module in patriot is that correct that's correct in all these um you have a whole bunch of beams coming out of it mm -hmm. as it's shown right there this is actually out of a reference manual for patriot operators so the orientation of this equipment is nothing compared to what it should be mm. but where you see um tvm tvm track and tvm downlink that's a portion of the missiles flight for pac 2 missiles where i get down below where it's, i mentioned this is like a, a ground-based intercept but during the tvm phase that's track via missile where the radar is illuminating the target and the missile is downlinking to the radar saying this is what i'm seeing of your illumination and based on that the missile is vectored to the target during the final phase only it does a patriot missile have its own onboard radar or is it just purely dependent on the mother radar that's the difference between pack two and pack three mm. and beyond that i just that's probably as as uh, deep into it as we need to get roger that's fine so okay so it sounds like pack two is probably going to be what we call a fox one without its onboard radar and pack three is probably going to be fox three with its onboard radar so the equivalent to this of course is the uh, is the sa-10 system the the soviet order russian system when they did exactly the same thing so then we move on to the launching station it transports it orientates and it launches and that's obviously a modular system where we can stack missiles on top and we'll talk about that a little later the guided missile it, it tracks target relays target signals and uh, attacks the target. 
we have a ECS. Uh, what does ECS stand for, please? ECS is the Engagement Control Station. So that monitors readiness. It controls the search and track. It invokes ECCM. Threat orders, control miss, controls missile, provides human communications. It's uh, the brain, then. Uh, yeah, it sound, uh, sounds like it. Although, as we'll see later, there's a bigger overview brain, which makes it very interesting. And the ECCM is electronic counter countermeasures. So mm -hmm. it... It's a way of trying to um, see past jammers. Mm -hmm. We have the AMG, and I've always been confused by this in the game, provides amplifiers and support of antennas used with communications equipment. So I used to think this had something to do with the missiles. It turns out this is essentially data link in terms of communications, human communications. Yes, that's correct. We'll get into that as well as uh, the nature of those communications later as well. And finally, in this, uh, just this overview, EPP, which is, if you like, the power station, I guess, supplies electrical power for ECS and RS. Let's move to the next slide. So first is the ECS, the Engagement Control Station. Inside this truck is where the radar tracks are evaluated. So it's going to be like, a, kind of like sitting in the back of a, a F-14 Tomcat or something. You're in front of a radar screen and you have various controls. Uh, evaluated engagements are initiated and communications to higher levels of command occur. The shelter is quite large but cramped. Much of it is taken up by communication equipment, weapon control computer and the engagement stations shown below. On the picture to the left, the enlisted soldier, TCA, sits in the chair on the left while an officer sits on the right, TCO. The assistant is the one who actually fires the missile when commanded to by a kill chain down to the TCO. The launch switch is just above the green lit switch in the picture to the right. The two operating consoles are identical, but the upper ones are different. Above the TCA's console are a number of switch indicators for powering up systems and diagnostics. Above the TCO's console are controls for lighting and air conditioning mostly. In between the two is the missile launcher inventory as well as the weapon control status display, denoting the degree of freedom the unit has for initiating engagements ranging from don't shoot nothing up to if it flies, it dies. Below that, between the scopes, is an AMG antenna control and sway monitor used to determine when the masts may need to be lowered or guy wires set up. So is it just two humans in here, Nick? There's actually three, and I made a mistake with that, that writing. The, the picture where I referenced the engagement switch, that's the one on the left rather than on the right. So there's the TCO and the TCA, like I mentioned, and between them sits a, um, basically a communication specialist. And the communication specialist, um, he monitors all the, the radios, but he's also kind of, when, when the TCO and TCA are in the middle of the air battle, sometimes they need a separate, basically extra set of eyes on the scopes mm -hmm. to give warnings, because you kind of get a bit of tunnel vision mm -hmm. and a good, a uh, radio operator will keep you on your toes. Feeding on from that, one thing I've picked out here is and communications to higher levels of command occur. So at some point, so these guys can't just sit here and shoot down planes. Presumably they need uh, permission to do so from someone else up the chain. I mean, what's an example of how high that chain goes, if we're allowed to know, in a typical engagement? I can just say very. It's above battalion level. I know the training as well for the TCAs are, I think it's a minimum of seven years training to be uh, the guy that operates the actual radar itself. Well, you've got to know a lot about... Exist. No, no, that's incorrect. TCOs are just, they come right out of college, they get their commission, they go through their six months of school, just like the enlisted guys, and um, then once they arrive at the unit, you start working as a crew, and once you have demonstrated your competence, that's when you're qualified to become a fully qualified crew. Ah, I was under the impression it was uh, the training for the radar was uh, a five-year like diploma or something, but that might have been for a different SAM site. Yeah, probably a different SAM site. I mean, you can have like a 18-year-old kid there at the, the engagement station. Wow. And the 18-year-old kid actually pushes the button to fire the missile, yeah? So he's not acting autonomously. He has to work through several layers of command before he can actually... Yeah, so it's not just him deciding to shoot things down. He is a cog in the human machine by the sounds of things. 
it's really kind of a weird thing that doesn't really have a whole lot of authority unto itself. This TCA, he's got a lot of buttons around his screen. I mean, does he can actually control the radar? Because when you're a radar operator, one thing I know is that you need you need to do a lot of things, you know, to operate that radar, um, changing PRFs and all sorts of stuff. Is that his job as well, the, the TCA? The TCA is much more equipment oriented, so yes, but um, in terms of operating the radar, once you go into radiate, it's doing its own thing, how you've configured your system. So is there quite a lot of automation going on here? To an extent, yes. So both the TCO and TCA go through a, a drill of ensuring that their system is co correctly configured, that all the options are set of where you want the, the radar looking, um, because the radar is stationary, it doesn't move side to side or anything. Um, they have to put in the different types of airspace, where all the defended assets are and stuff. And then the switch indicators are for basic um, variations on how you set up your equipment. Mojab, now you notice that it can monitor tracks. A track means a track file of a aeroplane. Uh, how many tracks you can monitor at once or has that changed so many times through the years that the number is irrelevant? I can't even remember how many it can track. The screens can get pretty cluttered. Oh, you don't mean how many targets it can track. You mean how many different objects it can yeah, identify yeah. in its track file or in its uh, yeah, yeah. its inventory. That's, yeah, yeah. I just thought, I just thought that would be interesting. Do you know, when did the first Patriot go into service, Nick? Do you know? It is a weird mix of modernized equipment and old. You see the old green monochrome CRT mm. skills. Mm. So some things have been vastly upgraded and other things are really stuck back in the 70s. So, oh God, it must be a nightmare to maintain that shit, right? The radar is much more than the ECS. Um, the radar was something that if you look at it wrong, it breaks down. And there have been times where we would be on site 24, 36 hours from the radar and you don't go home till it's fixed. So. When I was stationed in Germany, we were forbidden to actually fire up the radar on Fridays because nobody wanted to be stuck over the weekend working on the thing. Are these things manned, if they're operational, are they manned 24-7, presumably? That's correct. You mentioned ECCM. Um, I can't remember what it stands for now, but it's kind of a countermeasure against countermeasures. So is that to attack hostile jammers and stuff like that? It's to resolve the target rather than to, in other words, if someone's jamming you, and there are various different types of jammers I'm not gonna get into here, mm. but it basically tries to see through the jamming. It was uh, first deployed in 1984. 1984, right, so it's relatively modern. Okay, anything else on the ECS guys before we move on? I think we can go to the next slide unless anyone has any other questions. Probably my favorite bit, the radar. There's not a lot to say about this, except although it's capable of rotating 360 degrees, it is not a 360 degree radar. In normal operation, it's kept pointed in the anticipated threat direction and can only see about 45 degrees off the center line, so 90, about 90 degrees uh, total. Externally, the Pack 3 system and the Pack 4, so these are generational, Pack 2 is old generation, Pack 3 is new generation, launchers are virtually indistinguishable from each other. The photo on the left is the Pack 3. The model kit on the right is the Pack 2. The only way to tell the difference is Pack 3 has a split ladder due to the additional two doors under it. The Pack 2 doesn't have any doors under the ladder. The actual radio frequency comes out of the front of the box on top of the radar. The tents the troops are setting up on top is to keep interference out to reduce spurious track. On the photo to the left behind Behind the two vertical doors behind the soldier on the ground are the IFF, GPS and console for powering up the radar. The large horizontal doors cover the power amplification stages while the two open doors on the corner are for large radiator. Note that the three heavy cables, those go to the EPP, the power station module. There's an additional smaller cable that runs from the ECS to the radar. First of all, things are picked out there. The the, the tent thing, that's going to be inter radio interference, presumably, or things that can interfere with the dish. Uh, Roger, say, um, you know, residual RF that gets reflected off a target, comes down, it bounces off, 
say the ECS and comes back at the back of the radar, mm -hmm. for example, or just any additional RF that, you know, that this is a, a microwave signal that other signals can interfere with it. Mm -hmm. And so this, it, this tent is a really thick fabric that's supposed to keep anything out. And without it, you would see all kinds of weird stuff that's not necessarily targets in front of you. Now the PAC-2 one, that's a model kit mm -hmm. on the side, and that would still have the same tent. Mm. It's not modeled right mm. there. Do we know, again, this is going to have changed through the generations, I suppose. Do you know the maximum range that it could track an average target? Is there such thing? There is. I don't know if it's been published. Mm. But at the same time, you don't engage at the farthest range. You engage much closer, and I'm not going to get into how much closer, but um, there's a optimum kill ratio or optimum probability of kill and at that range is where you do your engagement right set. so it's like the aeroplanes then it's like missile fights and aeroplanes we don't just launch at maximum range because it's pointless you just waste your missile so there's it sounds like you've probably got a similar thing like a dynamic launch zone like we have in our aircraft and you fire at a certain distance where the probability of kill is maximum so that makes sense next question um this can, can we allowed to know it can this track and fire on multiple targets, or can it only fire on one at a time? No, you can have more than one missile in there. And oftentimes they're launched in pairs simply to increase that probability of kill. You can engage multiple targets, but I'm not going to get into how many targets mm. you can be engaging in at once. That's interesting. I've got a question about that. Send. Um, what's the uh, like the maximum altitude? Or is there a way of getting above it without it actually seeing you at no all? No way. No. No now, way. this missile system replaced the Nike Hercules, which is an anti-ballistic wow. missile. I mean, the Hercules uh, could go hundreds of thousand feet. Hundreds yeah, of thousand and feet, the Nike so. Hercules was, yeah. No chance, then. Uh, no, no, low no, Earth no, orbit no. kind of thing. Nothing. <laughs> so, no, um, it's 75 miles up is from what I hear from my dad, who mm. worked on the Nike Hercules. Mm. In terms of ballistic power, you know, the actual how high can the missiles go and stuff like that, that hasn't actually really increased over the years. What's increased is the sophistication of the tracking systems and the maneuverability of the missiles with vectored thrusts and stuff. But the original SAMs, the originals, the Nike Hercules, the SA-2, were actually, this isn't strictly true, but, you know, more or less the longest ranges, they could go the highest out of any of them. Uh, in the 60s so 50s and 60s so it's kind of weird how it's gone back but these are much harder to beat and much more versatile and can track more targets and stuff like that well perhaps the the coolest missile that that i ever saw was actually if you look up online the sprint missile mm -hmm. there's some fantastic video of uh, of a launch on it and it it travels so fast that the outside of the missile becomes hotter than the bell housing of the rocket motor propelling it oh, wow. and so it begins that the outside shell begins glowing shortly after yeah, that, it takes I off. believe that's a hypersonic missile, a wow. sprint made by the same company. Yeah. Well Just back to the radar. Are we allowed to know any rough differences between the Pac Two and the Pac Three radar? Pac Two and Pac Three are. Let's see here. The Pac Three was upgraded to be able to launch with the Lockheed martin pack three missiles mm. these are also sometimes called uh, config two and config three or rep two and rep three internally there's many items that are the same but the power supplies have a difference and there are more twts which are traveling wave tubes it's a type of amplifier there's more of them in the pack three mm -hmm. radar than there are in the pack two mm -hmm. I notice you've got some seriously heavy duty three phase cables going into this. So we're allowed to know the wattage of this kind of system. A crap ton. <laughs> yeah, I thought that might be a lot. Okay, guys, anything else you guys want to know? Obviously, and this, this whole thing can turn around, can it? Or do you have to move the actual wheel trailer around? You're obviously not going to. Oh, it turns it. on a turret on that trailer. Right. You're not going to slew it 180 degrees from where it's at because yeah. you'll start cooking yourself in the ECS. But you have the opportunity to slew it from one side to the other if necessary. Roger, have you ever had to been in a position where you've had to slew them? Or have you always had them in the original cone? You will always slew it when you set it up to ensure that it's evenly loaded on all those outriggers. Mm -hmm. You may have to slew it if you're doing some maintenance and have to get to one of those doors where it's easier if it's turned sideways and you can walk onto it from the trailer rather than getting a ladder operationally 
there's some called a primary target line and a secondary target line. And so if you have to pick up a second field of fire, you can rotate it to the left or right to pick up an additional target line. If there's a different threat that you're focused on rather than your original threat, but that goes to the planning of the site from the get-go. It's typically not something done on the fly. This is a bit of a boring question, but it's just an interest to me. So I'm moving into a house and I'm going there next week um, to because it's next to a power substation. I'm going there with a Gauss meter I've just bought to measure the micro Teslas of magnetic radiation. Um, now this won't give much magnetic radiation out, but it will give a lot of electro radiation, kind of voltmeters. Were you ever warned, kind of health and safety, about the dangers of frying yourself in front of this radar and things like that? Was there any any things to be wary of like that? If you see on those pictures, those black and red diamonds mm -hmm. uh, labels all over it, those are saying that there's a microwave hazard and not to approach within a certain um, distance. Mm -hmm. When this thing is operationally, you never move forward of the ECS mm -hmm. until the people in the ECS know that you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and they stop this from radiating. So what it does for long-term exposure, I couldn't tell, mm -hmm. but there, there are um, procedures in place to keep you from getting exposed to microwave radiation. Just for giggles, uh, how many of you guys have actually cooked your lunch in oh, front of this array? That. <laughs> actually, none of us. It's one of those things that uh, if you have some too close to that radar window, you will damage the radar itself. Mm. Yeah, we just never really tried cooking that, our lunch. That, that would be, <laughs> it would bounce off your lunch and hit back at the receiver with so much water, with so much power, that it would just destroy itself, wouldn't it? Because, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I understand. I mean, we've we've warmed up food on exhaust manifolds or or you know other heat sources. Just no one's tried it with the radar mm. itself. Okay, everyone, slide four. We're now talking about the electric power plant EPP. Perhaps the biggest pain in the ass to set up. The EPP is the electrical power plant providing power to the radar and ECS. It consists of two air-cooled diesel power generators. Air-cooled, interesting. Only one of which is run at a time. Switching generators or paralleling them can be tricky because not only does the frequency have to match 400 hertz compared to the 50 hertz that you have in your wall outlets, but a position in a cycle has to match up as well. An explanation for this is right here. Patriot's equipment is loud, the EPP is loud, the ECS is loud, the radar is loud. But on a Patriot site, the loudest noise is the EPP dropping power. The silence is deafening and will wake you up from even the deeper sleep. This will happen if a generator runs out of fuel or is paralleling wrong. Ooh, I've got questions. Me, 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 me. In what case would you have to parallel them? Why, if you had extra units on the site or something like that? You parallel them as just daily operations. You don't want to run. You can run one of those generators 24 hours a day, but you don't want to. Do we? Just for load balancing. Okay. Are we allowed to know what wattage they kick out? You know, I think I saw somewhere 150 kilowatts. 150 kilowatts. So that is, yeah, that's a powerful old little station, that is, isn't it? Bearing them on a ring main in a house is, what, 3 kilowatts? So you got some power there. Why is it 400 hertz instead of 50 hertz? Is that just a na normal thing when you're handling high powers, or is it special to Patriot? No, it's special to aerospace. 400 hertz is common amongst aircraft as well. One of the benefits is when you're looking at designing a power supply, say like a transformer, the ability to the size of that power supply shrinks on a scale based on frequency. So you can have much smaller letter power supplies with a 400 hertz system than you can with a 50 or 60 hertz system. So this, this puts out a lot of power. So how long would you be able to keep that, say that, that uh, EPP there for without actually having to return to base or whatever to like put more power into it? Those yeah. are diesel powered generators. So as a part of the unit, you have a, a Hemet based fueler also. And that that's a critical piece of equipment because all the launchers also have generators that need to be fueled. So these can run indefinitely as long as you continuously refuel them. 
Oh, so you it just, just uh, something I picked out from there. You said the launchers have got sub generators. Is that because you can operate them away from the these units? I'm guessing that's what we're going to come to, isn't it? That's correct. So, and you have the habit that just goes around refueling all, everything that needs diesel. Then, I suppose. Yes, that's correct. Now, um, while I was in Iraq, actually, we had our habit. The pumping system had failed, and we had to fuel this EPP up with five gallon jugs, which took forever for one. Mm -hmm was hot and we were wearing our chemical uniforms and we were having to lift these five gallon jugs up over concertina wires so it's very critical that you have a working fueler otherwise everyone's just hating life on the the whole pat site yeah five gallons is very big that is very big isn't it jesus that's half of a, a car petrol tank i don't know how many what the fuel uh, tanks are and the the size of the fuel tanks in in these things but the the five gallon jugs we we were left in those for uh, it seemed like an hour or two almost and we ended up wearing almost as much diesel as we put in the the back yeah. of these generators roger well it's uh, i mean diesel generators are incredibly efficient ways of converting chemical to electrical energy but at 150 kilowatts yeah you're burning through a lot you know that's a lot of diesel being sucked in there let's all move on to power uh slide five so we've got the antenna mask group the amg while the antenna mask group is modeled in the game i don't think the need for comms is thus it's vital in reality and possibly irrelevant in game the twin masts extend about 100 feet or so but fold neatly on the back of the truck they're put in a place with the combination of pneumatics hydraulics and hand cranking the amg creates the communication network between different units depending on a comms plan which determines elevation and azimuth of each antenna a good comms plan is created so there's more than one line of sight path to each unit for redundancy's sake a unit without communications is dead in the water so this is very interesting so are we purely talking about human to human voice communication here uh negative this is both voice and data communication right so it's data link as well so what's it actually going to communicate with another amg kind of over the horizon or to something else with a, a comms plan you're going to form like a complex web between all of the different patriot sites as well as the icc and if you have any relay stations um, that way you have multiple lines of sight um, the data just flows it, it gets broadcast to everyone and picked up by only who it's addressed to. Actually, this stuff, you, uh, this stuff is actually um, surprisingly highly modelled in DCS. We didn't think it would be until we started doing some testing. And traditionally, what you think is you just have a, uh, a, a standalone Patriot site in DCS which has all of the units we've described they're all roughly closely together within you know a couple of hundred feet and they act alone in reality they don't act like that you have subunits of Patriot all over the place um, connected like uh, Nick's saying like a big spider web and um, that is actually how it works in DCS we found you can put sub units of, of Patriot and SA-10 and SA-11 up to about 60 plus miles away from each other and that you that data link distance the distance you can put subunits away from each other is determined by the communication system so something like you've got here this AMG the reason we've got such high masts here is so that we can use them we can go further you've got things to worry about like curvature of the earth that's a real thing if you want to get around curvature of the earth you put a hundred foot high mast up like this and then you can put another subunit from this uh, patriot site 60 odd miles away because you've got that line of sight ability and the distance of those data links like i said is modeled so if you go and take an sa6 it can only data link about 10 miles away whereas a patriot like i said 60 70 miles you can put subunits and we'll talk about subunits and spider the uh, the, the layouts and and um, sorry that's not the proper words i'm using comms plan i think it's a proper word by the sounds of things uh, so that's what this communication is all about and we'll go into a bit of that in dcs as well each of those four dishes that you see on top of that all of those rotate to different azimuths so each one of those four things can be pointed in a different direction uh, let's move on guys uh, we're on slide six now collectively these are known as the big four so we've got the epp 
the radar, the ECS and AMG, everything we've looked at so far. And they're the heart of the air defense system. There are other vehicles that serve important roles, but these are absolutely needed to function. They typically range such as, so we have the EPP here, we have the power lines going to the radar. We have more lines going to the radar. Is that because the radar needs more power, Nick? That's correct. And we've got a line going to the ECS and a line going to the AMG. Regards spacing between these units, I guess it has to be quite small because they're all hard connected, cable connected, aren't they, in terms of power? That's correct. So the constraint is the, the length of the EPP cables. Each of those um, four antennas pump out four kilowatts each as well. Right, so they're pumping out four quality. So each one of those is pumping out like a ring main of a house, basically. When I got my MCSC, I was I worked with a, a guy from the Army that did the networking. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, these are networked like crazy. It's amazing what they do. Okay, that's fine. Now, obviously, we haven't talked about actually launching missiles. What we've got here can't launch any missiles. It's just a beating heart of the Patriot system. The missile launchers are going to be slightly separate. Okay, slide seven, guys. We've looked at what we need to operate, but we haven't actually started firing missiles yet. So for that, we need the launching station, the LS. The launching station comes in two flavors, the Pack 2 and the Pack 3, sometimes referred to as an ELES launcher for enhanced... Sorry, is it the Pack 3 that's the LS? Okay, all of them are referred to as... LS, but what you referred to as ELES is actually pronounced ELS. ELS. Is that just pack three? That's correct. So that's just add an additional level of confusion for you. Yeah, it's the enhanced electronics that go into that launching station that make it the ELS station. And that, that gives it the ability to fire the pack two as well as the pack two, or pack two as well as pack three. Okay, so pack three missiles can't be launched from a pack two launcher, but pack two missiles can be launched from a pack three launcher. So they're kind of backwards compatible, but not, yeah. Externally, they're mostly indistinguishable from each other and are mixed within units. So does that mean you have pack two and pack three within one unit? That's correct. I don't know if there are any total pack three units um when you go into a country the the logistics are you might not have all of one type of missile or another so um that gives you a certain amount of flexibility on what you put on your launchers roger additionally a pack 3 radar is necessary to launch pack 3 missiles a firing battery normally consists of eight launchers sometimes fewer but rarely more Shown below, the ECS has redundant comms with the launchers, VHF and fiber optic. So would a launcher always have fiber optic and VHF? Or would it, for instance, not have fiber optic if you want the launcher further away from the ECS? How does that work? Yeah, so within the constraints of a regular Patriot site, all launchers will be able to be reachable by fiber. If you had a remote launcher site, which I've never seen set up, but mm -hmm. there is the capability, those would not be on fiber. Roger, because I've done it in DCS where I put a launcher, you know, 20 miles away from the ECS or something like that. So that would have been on VHF at that point. Uh, however it works, God knows. But yeah, interesting. So if you have a Pac-3 radar, you can shoot Pac-2. Mm -hmm. But you can't shoot pack three with a pack two. Mm -hmm. Is that how that works? That way they can have one radar. They don't need to have two okay. if they have two different types of missiles. Does it mean you usually have eight launcher vehicles per ECS? That's typical, yes. Wow, that's loads. And each each launcher, bear in mind, has multiple missiles. So that is a serious system. So that's something I wasn't aware about, but okay. Just following on from this, guys, the next slide. Got some pictures. So What's that, 64 missiles at least? Yeah, that's crazy. Well, it depends how Ooh. many missiles you've got on each, each thing. So... Pack two on the left, pack three on the right. I can't see any difference. Can anyone see any difference? Uh, one looks like a double set. Uh, yeah, um, but they're modular. Are, they're modular, are they aren't, they, aren't they, Nick? So you can just add extra missiles well, to it, can't you? The pack twos, you can see, are ribbed for her pleasure, and yeah. the pack threes are they are smooth on the outside. Right. So that's how you tell the difference. Okay. On the launcher itself, you can't see it on that pack two configured one, so I can't tell if it's a pack three or a pack two. It, oh, so the other three. one, the other launcher, might be a pack three on the other side over there. There, there's a very, very subtle difference between the two and it's on the roadside so you can't see it from that view so i just put pack two configured launcher okay. rather than it was a pack two launcher they were different color as well <laughs> very good auntie very good <laughs> um, so you get four missiles per kind of um, block don't you and you can put two blocks or four blocks on 
So you can have up to 16, eight or 16 missiles, is that right? Yeah, you can have up to 16 missiles on a launcher on the pack threes. You That doesn't mean you always will. And that's why I deliberately picked this picture. Those are very heavy cans and there's, there's an incredible amount of weight or incredible amount of wear and tear on the lifting mechanism. So that's one of the reasons why you wouldn't necessarily have all four cans on a launcher, just because he can. And these launchers, they can twist 360 degrees and aim up and down, presumably. Must be able to, mustn't they? No, the the angle that you see is the angle that they are. There's oh. no there's no movement. I mean, they, they stow down for movement, mm. uh, but once they're in place, that's that's the angle that the launchers are launched at. Um, they can rotate from side to side. They can go 360 degrees, but um, once you're set in place, the direction that they're at is the direction that you're typically going to keep them at. Roger, yeah, that makes sense. And um, and just to confirm, we have a backup. We have a, a, a diesel generator for these. They have their own diesel generator, don't they? They've got their own power. Yeah, that's the big box you see mm-hmm. up at the mm-hmm. front of the trailer is that for the hydraulics on the the trailer that's for the electronic systems and for the actuators there is not a hydraulic system that's all those actuators are run on um what's mechanically known as a ball screw Hmm. wow it's a rotating mass that that lifts that up rather than having a hydraulic left that's the same type of server that's in the f14 wing box isn't it wow and they are they look at the size of it compared to those that's structures. why it uses so much power and then it's mm. an electric ball screw yeah but the idea just to confirm the idea it's got it's got it's got its own power is that so it doesn't need to be confined within the you know the the, the couple of hundred feet of the epp right uh that's correct these things are set up too far away from the epp and the typical load is that they use is not necessary that they need that big generator. Uh, now, this is completely irrelevant, but people like facts and figures at the end of the day. Do we know the max uh, re- usable ranges of the Pack 2 and the Pack 3 missiles? It might be out there, but I haven't verified it, so I'm not going to touch on that. When you look at a car engine or something, the power figure makes a difference. The actual max range of these of missiles like this isn't actually that important. I know it sounds weird, but you will never ever fire one of these missiles at the maximum range because to do so, the, the aircraft that's flying against you has to be going at an absolutely perfect condition, speed, altitude, and direction, and that will just never happen. So the maximum range isn't actually very important. I guess it would be around 50, 60 nautical miles, something like that. Pack three, possibly a little bit more. Are these missiles vectored thrust, Nick, or are they just standard normal rocket motors? They have a standard motor on them, and for steering with the Pack Three, they have uh, a number of really small rocket motors up at the front as well. Is that for maneuvering? And uh, that's correct. Interesting. Have you ever fired? Have you, have you ever been outside when we're at one of these fires? I've never been on a site that uh, did a live fire. Mm. Move on to the next one, guys. This is literally answering my next question, which is what happened when you've used the missiles, and it looks like you move the you know four missile module with a crane yeah so um that truck right there is called the gmt or the guided missile transporter and it has a crane on it for loading and unloading the cans after they've been spent uh you can do it with forklift as well uh reload time is about one hour to pull all four cans off put four cans on and uh get your people safely away from the launcher. Roger. Now, interestingly, I've just done some timings, or, or my buddy's just done some timings for reload times in DCS. Let's just go and check it out ever so quickly. Sam reload times. We've just been timing them in DCS. So we've got the Patriot to reload uh, four missiles on a launcher. Takes, ba ba ba, seven zero, 70 minutes. Did that sound about right for four, mis- for four um, not four missiles, four um, packs, whatever you call them? For one launcher, that would seem okay-ish. Um, that, that certainly is within the, the time frame I believe is allotted. An hour is a really good time to have. I've seen as low as 45 minutes. Roger. Okay, cool. That's the, the published time of about an hour is essentially when there aren't missiles inbound. If you have a hot situation where there's missiles inbound, uh, you have probably ways of making things happen faster that 
shortcuts that you wouldn't take when you're being evaluated because you don't have an evaluator waiting there to fail you if you do a shortcut or something out of sequence. Uh, one hour to reload. Uh, is that ready to fire? One hour? Uh, yes, that's correct. Or one launcher. Okay, guys, let's move on to slide 11. The final piece of equipment in-game at the ICC or the Information Coordination Center is a higher level of command from the individual firing batteries. They can see the air pictures of all the subordinate units. For units that have overlapping field of, fields of fire, they ensure that the target isn't get engaged by more than one unit. And they serve as another link in the kill chain that determines if a target gets engaged or not. It looks externally and internally very similar to the ECS. You will only see one of these per four or so firing batteries and they will be co-located with one of them. When they are, they still remain functionally separate from the firing unit they share a site with. Because communications and the kill chain aren't modeled in the game, I don't think this one serves as much of anything. From this view, the major spotting differences between this and the ECS are the generator panel above the printer and at and AMG sway monitor. And the launcher inventory is replaced by a number of unit status displays that appears as black bars at the top center panel. So if we just have a look at an overview here, we would have a battery here with eight launchers, a battery here with eight launchers, a battery here with eight launchers, and so on. And for all of that, we've just got one, one single ICC. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And those CRGs that you see to the left and right, those are the communications relay groups. Regards the ICC, that could be spaced, especially bearing in mind we've got a relay group, that could be spaced a long way from the firing batteries, couldn't it? That's correct. Now, very roughly in DCS, I haven't tried this extensively, but I think this is all pretty much modelled in DCS. So you would have a battery like this. We probably wouldn't put eight launchers in because, well, we just didn't know you did. We'd have one, one or two launchers over here. And we'd have this battery 60 miles over here and this battery 60 miles over here and this battery 60 miles over here. And then you can, I believe, put the ICC in the middle within data link range of about 60 or 70 miles. And they will uh, add intelligence to the Patriot system in DCS. And I don't know what intelligence because I'm not privy to you know what goes on there but it will increase as far as I'm aware efficiency uh, uh, essentially what we'll see is that the sites will be smarter they'll know where a hostile is come from going to come from and so they will have the radar already pointed at for that hostile because of information that the ICC is telling that particular radar so to an extent how far we don't know because getting information out of Eagle Dynamics is harder than getting you know getting out of NASA or I don't know whatever so we think it does have some function but to find out exactly what is, is, is hard to know what other information have you got for us Nick on the ICC is it something you've ever served on uh, no fortunately I was never on an ICC crew that's that's a bit closer to higher command than I ever really wanted to be. And um, I was on a maintenance crew that maintained the ICC. Now, the ICC does not exert any direct control over the launchers. It can't radiate. It can't launch. What it does is it coordinates the air battle between the different batteries. And it down tells to them what weapon control status to be in, um, whether they need to be radiating or not. And so those bars, those black bars will refer to if the firing unit is at the status that the ICC told them to be. I'm guessing, again, we're talking human to human contact and we're talking data link. That's correct. And are we talking, we're talking radio communications because we've got an AMG here. So that must be radio communications. Uh, yes, that's correct. It's some kind of, in, it must be encrypted in one way or another, I'm guessing, for the site. Uh, yes, that's correct. In real life, is there a maximum range of those AMGs, do we know? There is, but I can't remember what it is. And it's dependent partially on the terrain and partially on how high you have those masts so. up. Yeah, it's the same in, D same in DCS. I mean, you always have the masts fully up in DCS, but it's, if there's a, if there's a, undulating hill in the way then it won't work obviously you do have to have real line of sight over the horizon line of sight who how many people are occupying this and what ranks would they be do we know uh, this would be three people as well and they are composed of a very similar crew to an ecs and do they have the power to override certain decisions of a firing battery like can they stop a firing battery launching or can they only advise 
Uh, no, they can halt engagements or if, uh, if it appears that two batteries are tracking the same target, they can prevent one battery from firing. Like in DCS, can they give advance warning to a certain battery of, some, of a threat approaching? Uh, yes, they can, but they, what they see on their scope is only what the mm. firing batteries mm. see. So any advance warning that they're going to get is from higher layers of mm. air defense. So they're just another link in the chain, really. There's other people who have a much larger air picture, which will allow them to relay information down to the individual firing which, batteries. Which drives the next question, of course. So presumably ICC is in contact with AWACS. They have their own people that they're that they're in contact with, and I believe AWACS is in contact with the... You know, there, there's a much larger facility that's monitoring all the, the airspace, for example, through the, throughout the Persian Gulf. Yeah, so it's an entire network up and down. Uh, that's correct. So you have multiple tiers of air defense. You have, you have different netted sensors, and all of that is fused at a certain level. So Patriot only sees a very small piece of that pie. Yeah, God, it's complex. So they can take target information from higher up and and feed it down, as well as they can take information from the individual units themselves and feed it up. Uh, yes, that's correct. I bet that's a bit of a nightmare Very for some cool. network te technician to sort out, especially as you've got like different generation units talking to different generation units, uh, JD, like a generation two radar, yeah, going to a generation two ICC, yeah. going that's to a generation, come in. Yeah. generation three AWACS or a generation three cruiser ship or something. Can you imagine? Difficulty in that. Uh, right, this is going to be the coolest bit, isn't it? So, a tale of two packs. So, we're looking at pack two and pack three missiles here. Why pack, which includes a few variants, and pack three? To understand, this goes back to when Patriot was designed as counter air aircraft are lightly armored with lots of easily damageable vital components don't we know that the destruction of any one of these components could cause destruction of the aircraft because of this it's easiest to think that the pack 2 missiles to be functionally similar to flying claymore mines they get close to their target and then explode sending fragments into their targets works great against aircraft but against ballistic missiles not so much here's why a ballistic missile is largely unpowered it expends all of its fuel in the early stages of its flight after that it's in the hands of physics consider when you throw a ball while the ball is in your hand is equivalent to the thrust phase but once you release the ball it's unpowered relying on just basic ballistics to follow its natural trajectory so back to our ballistic missile it's flying along and a pack 2 missile comes along and blows up sending shrapnel into the target so what there's a good chance that the warhead could remain intact and fall to the ground and not necessarily to its original target but could be somewhere worse why because by that time the ballistic missile is a warhead sitting atop a large empty gas tank it's all dead weight there's nothing critical to be easily damaged like on an airplane pack threes were made by lockheed not raytheon and they were made as a reaction to the shift in mission for patriot to counter ballistic missiles they are smaller more agile missiles designed to hit to kill rather than to explode nearby i'm not sure how much is out there regarding this system which includes changes to the launches to the radar the system the software for the ecs it's most important to note the the reasons it exists and the difference how it engages so let me just try and summarize that for my own good so pack two uh what we call an old style missile a bit like an old i don't know aim seven sparrow or something would fly towards an airplane get roughly near that airplane at which point it sets off its proximity fuse which must be in here somewhere you've got proximity fuse laser radio whatever then it has a sp fires a big spread of ball bearings or ties or whatever out roughly in all directions forwards and sidewards and hopefully some of those the sub sub particles will hit the f-16 and take it out one way or another because you know hitting just about anything an f-16 would probably kill it uh, and then what they found i think nick correct me if i'm wrong but i remember specifically in 1991 oh god i can't remember now when saddam was firing scuds um which are for all intents and purposes big hunking ballistic missiles and they were coming pretty much vertically down well not quite but coming down rapidly against kuwait um and then 
Gen 2 Pac-2 missiles were being fired from the Patriots and they were hitting them. You could see them explode and, you know, the projectiles come out. But it wasn't stopping them. All it was doing is kind of nudging them slightly left or right or backwards or forwards and it was coming down. And instead of hitting a power station, it was now falling into a densely populated centre of, of civilians and doing what they considered actually worse damage to the point where they pretty much stopped firing the Patriots. Um, and so I'm um, presuming off the back of that came Gen 3, Pac-3, where we've got a smaller, lighter missile, probably self-guided, we don't know, and like... It a, is, it's, uh, it's Fox published, 3, is it, is it? They, are, they have Fox 3, so yeah. So it's a Fox 3, and the great thing about one of the benefits of Fox 3 is that you can get more accurate... Uh, because you can, you know, radar emit, radar guide, self-guide right the way up to the target. And like a lot of modern missiles, this probably isn't an impact missile where it actually hits the target. It might be, uh, but... Uh, it, it, the uh, is an impact, oh, impact missile. It is an impact, yeah, wow. absolutely. So that, now, that's it, impressive. It, 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 that's what it's designed to do. Hit right. The, so, hit the, um, uh, ballistic missile. so, so, yeah, these are just much more efficient ways of a missile to kill a target. Now, usually, uh, impact missiles that I've had um, familiarity with are low range missiles. And SA 19 has, oh, it's been a while since I've studied this, but an SA 19, I think, has an impact. Um, uh, a, um, uh, these are published 43 yeah. miles. 43 miles, yeah, Roger. Uh, a, a, so they're less range than the Pack 2, but range just isn't that important. Um, a, a rapier will be an impactor, so it'll actually physically punch into the target. It's very rare, actually, a missile, an air to air missile, actually goes anywhere near the target. It usually goes within tens of feet of the target and then explodes, and it does enough damage from that. But this type, more intelligent missile, more intelligent software, more intelligent filtering and radars and maneuverability uh, can actually physically hit a, a, hit a thing. And that, so, and that will allow it to physically kill a ballistic missile, presumably. I'm guessing that's the ethos. That's correct. And one thing I mentioned to you um, in the emails, but not in this, this um, PowerPoint thing, is a little bit of trivia. Lockheed proposed mounting Pac-3 missiles on F-15s. If you wow. Google airborne hit to kill, you will see their proposal for um, mounting these things in something that looks similar to a fuel pot. That is interesting. So you fire this hulking thing off, presumably with your own uh, radar on the F-15, and then eventually the radar on the missile is going to take over and impact the object. And would that be for firing against planes or uh, missiles, Nick? From an they actually, yeah, they actually implemented that system, but and they they exist. Is that for missiles? But they are for they're for they're for ballistic missiles. Mm, they mm. shoot from high altitude and shoot them when they're outside of the atmosphere. Do we have any evidence of these actually hitting ballistic missiles? Let me war time. I mean, in practice, you know what I mean. I've never seen pictures of you know. I've seen the drawings of it. I've never seen an actual Pack three slung underneath F fifteen. It seemed like a very very bad idea. Um, oh no, I don't mean they put pack threes on them. I mean they did develop a system for the F fifteen to do this. I don't know if it was this missile. They do have them. Yeah, it's the airborne hit to kill. And the problem is, is uh, air defenders sit there twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, watching the air, and um, you know they're just waiting for something to come along. And a, a F-15 just doesn't have the same loiter time as a bunch of launchers sitting on the ground. Let's go to slide 13, please. Um, Saddam was firing squids at Israel, Cap. Was it Israel? Was he? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they he have no to kills of scuds with... He was, with yeah, he was trying to go with Israel and to retaliate and to bring them into the war, and then it would have been the Arabs against the West. It's wow. Cool. I had no idea. Well... Okay, fair enough. All right, guys. Uh, right, let's push on. Setting up the site. There are a couple of things to keep in mind with a Patriot when setting up the site. It's not a 360 degree system. Now, that's an important thing, guys. It's not a 360 degree system. So we've got to learn that and know that the radar only goes in a certain direction. So, again, we've learned how we can get behind them now. Uh, nor is it set up randomly as some sort of bear trap to catch whatever flies going, going by. Instead, it's set up to defend a specific asset, a base, a city, an airport, whatever. And it must be set up either co-located with the asset or behind it with regards to the threat direction. For a similar reason, launches need to be emplaced within the radar fan as well. Any launches placed outside of that fan will be in, in, ineligible to launch from. There is a situation where placing launches outside the fan is acceptable. Those launches are still ineligible for launch, but give the unit some flexibility if such uh, thing is anticipated. So I didn't know any of that. So launches have got to be in the radar fan, 90 degree radar fan. The thing that it's defending wants to be in front of the radar fan. 
Um, and this is all for tactical reasons, um, because we're increasing the angle at which the hostile can attack the asset here and can be tracked by our radar if we do this. Uh, we're allowed to know the distance, difference between, the distance between the radar and the defended asset, Nick. Uh, like I said, the the radar could be co-located with a defended asset because it has its own defended asset as well. Um, because of the computational load of calculating all these these um, uh, trajectories, you kind of want to limit how much it's having to to work. So that's why you only have it focused on just the specific defended assets rather than all the airspace. Um, because this is a ground-based intercept, it has to see the missile as soon as it leaves the can, which is why the launchers have to be in front of the radar. It has to see the, where the threat mm -hmm. direct is because, you know, it's vectoring in those missiles from the, the launcher all the way to the threat itself. Right. And being yeah, so you can't have the missile launch from somewhere behind the radar and then eventually the radar picks it up and guides it. You have to have it know where it launches from. That's correct. And in addition, uh, when you set up a site, the launchers are often in a slight fan and it will pick the launcher that's azimuth is closest mm -hmm. to the threat itself. Note how they, they're fanned out, the launchers, in terms of azimuth as well. You can see there. Okay, Nick, um, thank you. Let's push on to slide 14, guys. This is really good information to know, though, when you're mm -hmm. setting them up, because I would have Roger. not set them. I would have set them up in yeah. a regular star. And we'll have to go and test them all back. An engagement is functionally similar to a ground control intercept, and for that to work, the radar must be able to see the launcher and missile. Additionally, it needs to see the area that it's tasked to defend. If the calculated trajectory takes a target outside of the defended asset, why waste a missile on it? So can you quickly talk us through this side view Nick? Uh, yeah, this graphic right here is just to demonstrate different um, ranges of missiles and different levels of responsibility for different uh, air defense. Patriot is really, it's, it's a small fish in a big pond. Mm. And so, yeah, that's the one that's the terminal systems above lower layer. And it really attacks just the smallest, shorter range missiles no i had no idea about that i yeah so thad is look so thad's about twice that of patriot and whatever that thing firing off of the uh ships is is even bigger look wow ah and that's what sm means standard missile three i was wondering what that means from dcs because we've got sm threes in dcs i believe very good um okay let's move on guys this this brings us to what is an acceptable target tactical ballistic missiles and that's it not rocket artillery or mortars, that's a CRAM mission, not drones. It's very good at shooting down aeroplanes, which is why post-2003 they aren't used against aircraft. In 2003, we had three friendly fire incidents. One of them was against a British tornado. I remember that. I remember that. It was massive here. Uh, this incident has been examined and re-examined the way one would with uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a number of factors that I know about that I haven't seen in any publicity available in reports, but I can say there were a number of errors all round and bad coincidences. Uh, that led to the incident. An FA-18 was also engaged. The details of that one are lesser uh, examined in the community. The third incident had an F-16 fire on a Patriot radar. What with a harm or something, I guess. This radar set has acquired somewhat legendary status, or at least it did, but may have been forgotten by now, with multiple units claiming to own it after it got rebuilt. I once saw one that I believe was that radar, based on the unusual residual damage that still existed, but I'll never know for sure. Did the missile hit the hit the radar then? Yes, it, it did. did. <laughs> yeah, it was a harm. So it was still rebuildable. Um, the one that I saw had a, a number of really unusual pockmarks mm. on some of the external doors that are not normal for Patriot wow. at all. How interesting. 
The second reason Patriot isn't there to engage aircraft is the US in particular and its NATO allies in general operate on a principle of attaining air supremacy, not to be mistaken with air superiority. I don't actually know the difference, but that's for another day. As quickly as possible, Operation Focus of the, 60 day, of the Six Day War is a perfect example of this. The open actions of the 91 Gulf War is another, where the first targets were to destroy the airfields and air defences. The current doctrine is that gaining control of the skies is not the domain of air defence. Fender. They focus on tactical ballistic missiles. CRAM is perhaps the most relevant portion of air defense today with the prevalence of counterinsurgency instead of fighting between better equipped nations. And we have a link there. Okay, so it's an anti-missile site nowadays. It's not for shooting down planes. Obviously, we use it for shooting down planes in DCS, but okay, that's interesting. Uh, does that mean that it won't shoot down planes if the oh. situation arises where it needed to? Or... It just doesn't like to shoot down planes in general. Well, it's it's certainly very capable, but whether anyone will ever authorize it to engage against a um, aircraft is uh, probably never going to happen. So two questions I've got from that. One is, uh, we never found out what the difference between air supremacy and air superiority is. Can you describe the difference, please? Yeah, sure. So with air superiority, you have a advantage within the airspace um, within in relation to the opposition forces. With air supremacy, you have complete and total control of the air airspace where uh, your opponents are not able to launch. They have no aircraft. They have no operational airfields. If anything they have is in the air, it's because you've allowed it to be. Roger. And are there any examples? I mean, what's, have you got a good example of one of these? Yeah, the, the one I mentioned in the slideshow was Operation Focus, conducted by the Israelis in the opening morning of the Six-Day War, where they took out the entire air forces of Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, all in one fell swoop. For the rest of the war, they had complete control of the airspace. Okay, and second question, why have we got a picture of a laser show and a phalanx on a truck? Yes, yeah, so that's what's known as CRAM, or Counter Rocket Artillery and Mortar. And it is a phalanx on a truck, and what appears to be a laser show is all the, the um, tracers coming out of that. And that is to engage incoming mortars or um, artillery or rocket artillery or whatever that's being lobbed into um, camps. Which you see the, the white at the end of those tracers mm -hmm. are those rounds all self-destruct at a certain range because it's firing off a lot of rounds downrange and you don't want those ending up in, over um, uh, civilized areas mm -hmm. or Okay, guys, so just next thing is a slide 16, and that just shows some useful links, and I will link them in the description of this video. So if we move on to slide 17, uh, slide 17 to 20, what are the relevance of these, Nick? Okay, so these are from a report that I found online. Um, is noted they're all unclassified, and they are the ranges of various missile systems. Um, some of them are short range, some are... Um, intercontinental range. Um, what's lost in these images is the surrounding countries, so you don't get a good view of what the geography is around it, but you can kind of infer that based on um, the ranges listed for each of those missile systems. Roger, do we have Patriot in here, by the way? A negative. These are offensive missiles. Oh, I see. These are offensive missiles, right. Okay, fine. Very good. Okay, next we can move on to the uh, the, the visualization of the units in DCS. So I'm going to jump to slide 23 here. So from the right to the left, I should know, know these by now. It's actually left to right. It's AMG. Uh, we've got ECS we're there. We've got EPP there. We've got ICC there. We've got the launcher, the LS there. And we've got the radar there. Anything you want to say about the modeling of these in DCS? The model for the ICC is incorrect. It may be a correct model for something, but it's definitely not an ICC. Um, the ICC does not have turnbuckle tie downs on the side, mm -hmm. and it looks visually identical to an ECS, except you'll notice that the ECS has a thick mast 
in the middle on the side of it, that is for communications with the launchers. The ICC doesn't have launchers, so it doesn't have that mast. But in all other ways, the shelters are visually identical. Roger. Okay, guys, very good. Um, if we look at slide 24, so this visualizes the what, what Nick was just talking about, about how the in reality they're essentially identical but in dcs they're actually modeled differently i mentioned how strong the um the antenna mast is mm -hmm. when i was stationed in el paso someone decided to move one of the ecs's from one parking lot to another and he just picked up the chalk blocks and the ladder on the back and he went rolling forwards and uh he didn't drop the antenna at all mm -hmm and it snagged on a telephone line and i don't know why he didn't notice it but um, before that antenna snapped it had snapped about five telephone poles wow. and uh, ruined telephone communication within this whole compound for um, many months i i think it was like six or nine months before they even got everything back up right so that's a well-engineered piece of kit then Mast is surprisingly thick for it. Uh, should we move on to setting up the site? We begin with intelligence preparation of the battlefield, which is the systematic process of analysing the mission variables of enemy, terrain, weather and civil considerations in an area of interest to determine their effect on operation. To place a Patriot you need two things, a threat and something to defend. Without both you have no reason to be there. In this case, the mission is to provide air defense to Sharjah International Airport. For this simulated deployment, we will say that through imagery, we have determined that TBM launchers have been placed on Abu Mas Musa Island. This is a bit too close to be realistic, but I wanted to keep this image small. You'll see below, we have an azimuth of 3 to 1 from the Patriot side to Abu Musa. This will be our primary target line, PTL. The acronym TBM is for a tactical ballistic missile. That's mm -hmm. kind of a shorter range scud. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned PTL because you can have what's known as a STL or a secondary target line. If there's an additional threat that you might have to pick up, say you have a, say you have a different unit adjacent to you and they go down and you have to provide coverage for their threat, you will already have programmed what the STL is from your location to their threat. So you can just slew to, to that, but generally you're watching your PTL. Here we've in place the site at the end of the airfield. Our umbrella of protection dictates we shoot up and over the asset we're protecting. That means the equipment must be either co-located or behind the protected asset in relation to the threat. I only picked this location here because it's very similar to the location where um, my unit was set up at the end of Baghdad International back in 2003 but yeah there's there's a lot of planning that would go on into what you're defending and and what the optimum place is to put your system i just use this as kind of a, a easy example here we have our big four looking down range there's a very specific methodology to why the vehicles are placed the way they are the ecs is placed behind a radar and that distance is constrained by the length of the epp cables the cable reels on the epp on the roadside the driver's side while on the radar they plug into the curb side the passenger side on the ecs the cable plugs in into the hell hole okay the space behind the cab under the air conditioners and next to the gpfu a large air filter amg is placed at the rear roadside in such a way that if the antenna falls they won't damage anything this just mirrors what we showed uh, much earlier in the slideshow Below are some overview shots of the site. All launchers must be visible by the radar in order to launch from them, about 45-ish degrees to the left or to the right of the PTL. Note that the launchers are somewhat fanned out. The ones pointed on the same azimuth as the radar are called the PTL launchers. The others are skewed plus or minus 20 degrees in the example, an arbitrary number picked by me, to catch any threats coming off the planned target line. When launching, the system will select a launcher closest to the threat of the launch. Note the two Avengers. It's not unusual to have Showrad, short range, support at a Patriot site. It's not always there, but I included it because I had a Stinger crew at our site when deployed. So that's a view kind of from the back pointing kind of forward along the PTL. We've got the big four there and the PTL moving out this way. Uh, the launcher's fan plus or minus 20 degrees. 
Yeah, that plus or minus 20 degrees, whatever that plus or minus is, will be something that will be uh, decided by whoever's designing this whole deployment when they take into account any additional threats or whatever. For for our purposes, I just used 20. Um, in the, the whole thing where I put below, this was originally a Word document with all the pictures following it. So that's the yeah. confusion there. So the plus or minus 20 degrees, have you ever been in a scenario where you had to cover plus or minus 45 degrees, so a very wide angle? Negative. There, there'd be no reason for you to be that far off the PTL. What you have is you have a number of launchers that are pointed straight down to your target line. And I picked 20 because um, that's that'll put you halfway between your outer bounds and your PTL. If you have it slewed too far off the PTL, those guys won't be able to engage on that line. Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah. if they're slewed partially in between, they can cover the sector from the PTL to the edge. Roger, and I guess if you had to cover a wider area for some reason, you could just use another battery, couldn't you? Orientated differently. Actually, the thing is, is unlike a lot of units, Patriot does not operate as a single battery. You deploy as a whole battalion, and you would have multiple batteries within the theater. For simplicity's sake, I just placed one battery right here. Before we go into DCS and shoot some planes down, anything that you guys want to add? Yeah, there's a quick question. You said the launchers are pointed at a certain range, so once you set these up, and if your incoming target's not live, coming down to a certain bearing for that launcher, that launcher can't fire, you can't turn it around? So the launchers will turn only if commanded. And what would happen is, say, say we're pointing at three... 21 and if we had a target coming in at uh, at say 300 you would have the launchers on that side fire at it and they're able to the missiles are able to turn once they're up in the air you just have the launchers pointed in a general direction to to basically have them pre-staged a bit closer so they have to maneuver less to get towards the target. Okay, because for a moment they're talking about like, if you set up pointing, say, west, but they're coming from the east, you can't do anything about it. That's why the launchers are somewhat fanned out, so you have some available on one side and some available on the other. If something is visible within the Patriots' viewpoint, it'll be able to engage regardless. It's just you have an optimum setup for different sides. Okay, now for the fun bit, shooting stuff down. We've got the Patriot site here, as Nick showed you, and it's got a nominal range of about 53, 54, 55 nautical miles, it shows here, in ideal conditions. We've got a single battery with the big four here, a battery of eight launchers, 20 degrees left, 20 degrees right towards the threat, and a short-range defense there. No ICC, no second battery. Three tests we're going to do. Abu Masset is going to launch some cruise missiles at it, and we're see, going to see if it can shoot those cruise missiles down. Next, we're going to have an F-18 is going to fly at it and launch harms, and we're going to see if it can shoot those harms down. Finally, an F-16 is going to fly at it and see if, see if it can get under the Patriot radar and if it can get behind, because in reality, although these, like we were speaking to Nick, although these units can traverse 360 degrees, the launchers and the radar, in reality, that wouldn't be done and has never been done basically and we'd just like to see if it does it in DCS or not here we have a usa uh, ticonderoga cruiser with a vls and up go the top of hawks yeah beautiful right let's go check out the pat site so here we've got the pat site no kind of detection yet so, ah look so the satellite imagery or the awacs has now come through to the ecs uh, which is there which has come which has changed the radar azimuth so we have had a radar azimuth change so in dcs it looks like it aims the radar at whatever is being fired at it where in real life obviously that doesn't happen in real life we'll just keep the radar set in a certain direction so it sounds like it's going to work differently into dcs how in fact as well those launchers there are they've swiveled as well to face the threat as well again in real life as we said that wouldn't really happen not on the fly like that so that's a different way to how it works in real life Flying at a couple of hundred feet at about Mach 0.7, 0.8. I suspect it probably can see them. When it'll actually fire, because they're a slow, low-moving target, it's not going to fire until they are close ballistically. 
because the actual, although it showed a range of about 50 miles, the range at low altitude is probably something more like 10 miles, maybe not even 10 miles on a slow moving target like this. So what we're going to do is skip forward, 20 miles now, still no fire. So that's 10 miles now and they're still not fired yet, fingers crossed they will be able to fire. Maybe a line of sight problem with the buildings, I'm not really sure. They've definitely detected them as a target because they've pointed the radar and the launchers at them. Off they go! Weird. Completely desynchronic because I don't see any. Boom! Interception. One hit the one got to the runway. Intercepted another. Three. Pretty mediocre at best. It looks like three tomahawks got to the runway and three got intercepted. So they're just not very good at intercepting when you've got a whole bunch of, I know they weren't ballistic missiles, but a whole bunch of cruise missiles coming in. They were easily defeated there. So now let's go in a Hornet. We've still got plenty of missiles in the tubes, I think. I'm going to get in a Hornet and see if they will intercept small AGM 88s because I know an S300 can. Okay, 20 miles. I'm going to do my pop up attack now. Okay, we've got the radar, locking on, spike, tracking radar around you, 18 miles, Sixteen miles, hasn't fired at me yet. There you go. One out. out. Tally. And I'm launching now. One. Two. Two out. Three. Four. Right, I'm going to try and see next how these uh, missiles try and interact with me. Stand by. How is this missile going to try and interact with me? Right, so it's a non-hitting... It's a uh, non-impact uh, missile. It was a, it was a fuse... Proximity fuse and shrapnel like missile. A smoke bomb in so the it, sky heading towards the ocean. So it was a phase two missile, most likely, by the sounds of the thing. Possibly phase one. And it doesn't look like they're going to shoot the AGM-80 dance down. It just doesn't look like they've got the radar for it. Uh, that makes sense because we were told that it's not designed for this. Boom. And hits. One times Patriot sight down. One more thing to try, which is I'm going to see if I can respawn the radar in there and the missiles back in, just to see if I can sneak around the back of it or if it's going to turn and find me. Okay, F-16. Let's go and outsmart a Patriot sight. All right, I'm going to see if I can go below his, his radar beam. Okay, either I've got some terrain in the way, which is very possible, or I've gone below it. Can't be sure which it is. Pop up again, see if I can get engaged. Where are you, sir? Oh, he's over to the left there, look. I see him. Spike for no launch, I'll see. No, no launches. Do you my ranges to him? Uh, oh, missed that's a missile out, I think. Is that a missile out? That'll be a yes. Yep. I'm getting out here. Beat it. Right, what I'm going to do now is simply sneak around the side of him and see if he can track me or not. You were about 10 miles out. Roger. Just see if the radar's tracking me or not. Doesn't look like it. Oh, I don't I'll get the feeling I can get around the back of him here. I'm He's not pointing in that direction. Oh, yep. Tracking. 
not. Just turn. Yep, it's tracking. Oh, it knows where you are. Uh, I wish I knew where it was. Can you give me a heading to him, please? Okay. Oh, I should be able to see that. Where the hell is that? Oh, he's right next to me! Oh, shit! Yep, yeah, 9 0. Missile out. Two missiles out. Oh. Defeated one. Am I clean? Yep. Like right. It. Can I have a heading to you, please? I keep losing. Hang on a second. My terrible eyes keep losing. Oh, I got, don't worry, I've got him. Right, let's see how easy he is to get. Doesn't look like it's tracking. Roger. Look at my bloody gun. Right. Well, it's tracking. It's tracking again, Roger. Yep. I'm, I'm not. Oh, I doing, see you. Uh, I'm not doing a great job of hiding. If I'm honest, it's doing a pretty terrible job of shooting me. Pistol out. Oh my oh. god. Oh, I dodged! <laughs> 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 nice! <laughs> Missile out. Yeah, I got it. No problem. Missile out. Ah, god damn it. I got it. I got it. Oh, you got it. Alright, it's all about staying in that mile range so he can't get me. Captain Bell, stand by. It's all out. Altitude, altitude, low. Pull up, pull up, pull up. Good hits. Why? You can get. It's not dangerous. I can get in there easily. So. <laughs> I'm going to pause that. It can shoot down the cruise missiles, it can shoot down ballistic missiles, it can shoot down aeroplanes. It's not the phase three, it's the phase one or the phase two, probably the phase two. When I when I get close, to be honest, it's pretty appalling. It's nowhere near as good as an S-300. It be, probably because the missiles don't have vector thrust. You now it's a big, I don't know, half ton of missile, whatever. I can easily beat it in a nimble jet like this without too much fuss. At range, it if you don't know it's coming, it can be a bit dangerous, obviously, but should be easy to avoid as long as you know your launches you cannot get behind it it does track you including the missile launches they do track you and they're super easy to kill anything you want to add to that rc no it it definitely was tracking you and sent out at least six or seven missiles so right uh, yeah we'll kill you so to finish the video off to see exactly what we do have in dcs and what its capabilities are let's just jump down to where are we patriot so this is the search and track radar and what we can tell here is it is an an mpq 53 so this is indeed a pack 2 or a generation 2 radar it's a multifunction phased array radar 29 tons Radar detection range, which I was interested in, we couldn't get an answer, was 3 to 170 kilometers, about 110 miles. Obviously, that's going to depend on the aspect, the size, the altitude, and so what of the target. Search sector is interesting. It says here, this yes, that the Pac-2 can cover azimuth of 120. Well, Nick said it was definitely, he thought it was 90. So there's some disparity there dcs says 120 nick says 90 so i'll be interested in what you guys think about that elevation coverage for uh, 90 degrees so presumably that means kind of from dead straight forward up to the vertical of 90 so it can cover all the way to the vertical and tracking sector i think that what that probably means is it can traverse left 110 degrees right 110 degrees and if we split the azimuth from half and get 60 that means a total scan of 170 degrees left 170 degrees right so there is a tiny black spot in it which is if this is right modeled like this in dcs a tiny little 20 degree back corridor 
uh, that is not going to be scannable. So that's something that's interesting that we should have to try out at some point. Next, we have, have the Patriot launcher. So we've got the Phase 2 launcher head. We have a warhead here of 73 kilos, which is a whopping great warhead. It's the Mike 901. Launch weight, presumably that's the actual missile itself, is 700 kilos, which is enormous. And go up to Mach 5. Minimum effective range is about 2 miles, so super easy to keep within that 2 mile range. And remember, that is not a very maneuverable missile. Max effective range, it says here, of 160 kilometers, which is going to be about 90 miles. I've never seen one that could possibly go anything like 90 miles. The most I've ever seen one fire at is about 50 miles, but as ever, I stand to be corrected. Min effective altitude is a very important one here. 60 meters, that is very, very high. It's 180 feet. So all you've got to do to get below this, in theory, is 180 feet, which is very easy to do in a bloody Hercules, to be honest, let alone a fighter. So that's a real weak point of the Patriot there. Max effective altitude, uh, 24 kilometers. So that's about 75,000 feet. So unless you've got an SR-71, you're not going over it. And again, we've got a traverse of the turret of 110 degrees left, 110 degrees right. And bearing in mind that missile will bend a bit, that pretty much covers 360. So the most it can turn to is about kind of that there, if a guy was coming behind. And we'd have to fire and bend round to the side. And in DCS you get four SAM. Oh, that's interesting. You only get four SAMs because I specifically remember when we were doing our talk, you had one, two, three, four SAMs per one of these packs, 16 missiles. So that, I wish I still had Nick here, but unfortunately he's gone now. So for some reason in DCS you get four missiles for this launcher. But with the missiles that we were looking at, with Nick, we got 16. So what I'm going to presume that is, is that's the phase three, the pack three missiles. I'm guessing because they're so much smaller, you can get four per box. Whereas the missiles that we get here, here in DCS, which are a lot bigger, it looks like we only get one per box. So a couple of grey areas to clear up with exactly what we've got here. What pack are these missiles? And can the radar cover 120 degrees scan azimuth or 90 degrees azimuth? I appreciate your input into that and I hope you otherwise enjoyed that and see you later.